Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Voltron video. This is going to be my, I suppose, initial thoughts on Season 7. I did my sort of reaction videos to each group of four or three episodes covering the whole season yesterday. Now, I've, I've watched a, a little bit of, I haven't done a full, complete season rewatch, um, watched the whole thing again, but I've watched a couple of bits and pieces of episodes to kind of go back over the stuff I sort of forgot maybe gloss over a little bit but um yeah i want to give some more th thoughts on the full season addressing everything um i'd say overall it was a good season but i don't think probably not the best it definitely had some really really big moments and it probably had in a way the, like the most intense arc so far with the obviously the fight for Earth, basically, and d defending Earth, that was gotten across very, very well. But I think the the journey to get to Earth and then the length of the battle on Earth, pacing-wise, in terms of how they got the details across, how they used all the characters, there was definitely a, an element of messiness to kind of everything that was going on. Not everything felt super clear, like you were fully up to date, uh, up to speed with everything that was going on. I think that that detracted just a little bit from kind of everything that was going on and took away from what could have been a borderline, I think, amazing, perfect season and, and brought it down to just being, you know, good, very good. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, I suppose, why they chose to air this uh, as a full 13 episode season and not split it into the six or seven episode chunks they usually do. I think obviously with this one, it just wouldn't work. Imagine they did six episode seasons. Imagine ending on episode six. While I think some people really liked that episode, I think it would have been a season where there was very, very little substance to it. Um, and ending while like, okay, they're just there at Earth. It still, I don't think, has the overall um, appeal, uh, and, and I don't think it would have worked as well as a full season. Similarly, if you made it seven episodes, you're ending in the middle of a two-parter, and while, you know, that first part of the two-parter ends on a nice cliffhanger, it still, I, I don't think there'd be enough substance to it. So I, I feel this was the season they had to air as a complete 13-episode chunk, which I think helps to explain things. So... Um, that, that was interesting to look at and that there was no really, I think, clear-cut um, midway end point here. And then it, it all did flow together. And um, let's talk about the first half of the season here next. And <clears throat> I think the weakness with this chunk of episodes was just that there was a couple of episodes where if you're not overly invested on like what challenge they're facing within a specific episode. It makes their journey back to Earth just feel like prolonged unnecessarily um, because again some of the messiness of the writing around some of this stuff it, it doesn't work as well. Um, I think episode one is very good. Uh, I think it's definitely one of the best of the season. Episode two re-watching that one again because it's basically just one giant action scene for the most part and then ending on the whole uh, Ezor Zethrid reveal, it it makes the episode uh, a little bit of a chore to get through because it's a very limited action scene because the lines are low on power and while it gets the, st the stakes across of, you know, they're, they're in, in, in desperation mode, they can't go all out because they don't have much energy, they have so many other kind of, uh, you know, people and animals with them, they can't go full crazy maneuver mode because not everyone has seats and it would be kind of crazy people will get hurt and um, I think it was just a bit too long of an action uh, set piece uh, and then I think it's a similar thing with episode 6 where I feel it could have been a an excellent episode um, but because they really didn't explain much of what was actually happening Yes, it has some nice character moments in that Hunk gets to stand out in this episode. The big argument scene where all of the group is kind of tired and frustrated and they just are super honest with each other and kind of criticize each other. That was interesting to see. I think the overall episode just ended up feeling a little more dull, kind of boring than it perhaps should have been. And again, not explaining the result by the end that like, oh, Keith said something about friendship and then all of a sudden, oh, we can all use our Bayards again. The lions are back and they're basically fully recharged. It's like, 
what? And and I get they were sort of going for the whole idea of like this journey to get back to Earth is what forms them into like fully realized paladins in a way, but they never made it massively clear that there was this huge development that, that to make that connection. And I think that's where at times Voltron has been relatively weak of just doing these sort of power ups in such a like random way that they just sort of happen at times. Like like Hunk's weird um extra form of his blaster where he can fire out portable turrets. It, it only it was he only used it once and it was never made clear that that was some sort of a big development that he went through that the fact that he unlocked that extra mode on his blaster was something notable similarly a lot of the other Voltron upgrades we got this season like the the dual swords later on and the the booster rocket thing in earlier on those weren't uh, ever like really explained like I, I get it that we haven't got all the different combinations of like two Bayards uh, three Bayards and stuff like that to see just everything the Voltron can do but just the, the nature of like oh we've sort of kind of gone through something personal and then the ports just activate and they just kind of do it um, I wish there was a sense of like the 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 unlock sort of being tied directly and they're kind of pointing it out a little bit more Rather than us kind of having to be like, well, well, Hunk kind of unlocked that, but then it's a Keith and Lance thing that they actually end up doing, and it, it, little bits and pieces like that where it just the show communicating what that it, it's actually doing was a bit awkward to us. And um, it came up a bit later on as well with the whole Shiro's arm and the crystal from Allura's kind of crown tiara thing, um, like. They never said specifically what exactly happened, and they never pointed out that like, oh, the, 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 like, he's he's accepting this because it's Altaian tech as opposed to Earth tech. They never really said that, and then when Shiro was able to activate the the uh, the transformation of the Atlas, they never really brought it back to the fact that it's it's partly possible because of the uh, Altaian crystal in his arm. And, and it, it's the little connecting pieces where I think the audience is being asked to, I think, almost make a couple a couple too many connections in a lot of what's going on uh, here. And and it's not the case of, like, the sh I want the show to just be blatantly pointing stuff out, but it's like, I'm not even sure if we're meant to make connections here because it's just not explained, and I don't know if we are meant to come up with the explanation on our own or if it's just a case of it's not meant to be explained. Um... So th there was there was things like that that uh, I thought were a little not great. Similarly, like Oxia, really cool that she was introduced in episode three. It felt like she was suddenly jumping to becoming like a, a main character like thing. It felt like if you've ever watched Avatar, like this is Suki kind of fully joining the group in a way. But then they kind of went back and she they they roughly explained that there's a line of dialogue where she says like I'll do what I can here to help the Voltron Coalition. Whereas I think most people maybe just uh, heard or interpreted that as like, I'll help the Voltron Coalition. And in, and her not saying that like it's specifically out here is where she was referring to. And that's why we really didn't really see her. But then when, the, and then when she came back, it's just like, I feel you kind of do need to give an explanation for what's going on here with, with characters appearing and not appearing. And then as some people brought up like, I get that it was a plot point that Earth didn't have connection to, like, uh, communicate uh, interstellar kind of uh, to, to people, and that's why we couldn't really get the rest of the coalition involved in anything, as well as the fact that in the past three years, it's been taken down a lot. That's one thing we did get. Um, but it was weird that it seemed like it was just a dropped point of, like, yeah, we just have to accept that we're not going to get any help. And... I suppose the time skip itself was also a bit of a weird one in that, like, just coming out, okay, we've been actually been missing for three years, technically. And then them never really catching us up on, I suppose, the wider scope of what's actually happened in the galaxy in the past so many years. I My guess is that at the start of Season 8, that's when we'll get the real core of, like, Hagar's been missing for three years. She could have but didn't take advantage of Voltron being missing for three years but that probably means she has 
had a plan going for that long that she's kind of working into play. So I get why they were somewhat vague about that, but at the same time, it, it did feel a bit a bit weird to just have it happen. And again, like the scientific explanation of time on this show is a bit weird, um, but it is what it is. Um, but you know. It, while I'm criticizing bits and pieces here uh, early on, um, it still was overall good. Like there was enough good scenes, good character moments uh, in between maybe some of the frustrations that it it made the season overall still feel very, very good. Like I think episode one was very, very strong. And I know this is where the whole Adam criticism comes up. And uh, I suppose I'll get into that here because it's it's such a weird thing in this fandom that of everything that happened this season that is like the biggest talking point in the entire fandom a, a, a thing where there's only basically two scenes and the the basis for it being such a big talking point is that the creators talked about it at comic-con uh, and that's why people are complaining that it suddenly needed to be this bigger thing i get it i do get the point that people are making that I think the creators probably should have been a little bit more clear about we're mentioning this because we think it we know it sort of means a lot to you guys and we're saying that it's a thing we're doing in the show and you know while they did clarify stuff like that they're broken up it is more of a relationship from Shiro's past and it's not necessarily something they were planning on going forward with they did mention stuff like you will meet Adam and they didn't they weren't specific enough about the fact that like you'll meet him but like he's not going to be a main character and i think if they had said something along those lines you would have calmed people down and the expectations wouldn't be as high as they were so i think the creators sort of made this a bigger thing than it probably needed to be but at the same time i think the fandom has also kind of gone over the top with the criticism and the aftermath of this and um, in that if you look on tumblr uh like borderline like you get the impression that Voltron is a completely different show based on the way some people watch it and what they the only things that they want from it are, are specific relationships when I think it's pretty fair to say that romance is basically a non-factor in the show overall even the most depth that they've gone into there's only been a couple of scenes and most of them have been like relationship kind of setup moments rather than really showing characters within a relationship um, and that's where I think the Shira one is obviously it's a, it's a different type of thing in that this is not a case of like we've known Adam for a very long time and we're sort of teasing Shiro and Adam getting into a, into a relationship which is kind of what they're doing with like Lance and Allura this is though like, in the past Shiro was with Adam and he made this decision in the episode what we saw the the plot of episode one with the flashback and what was it about it wasn't about Adam the flashback wasn't about him that was just another addition to add depth to Shiro as a character in the in the backstory the main reveals were obviously establishing his connection with Keith and how they know each other plus also for him personally uh, I suppose the situation surrounding him deciding to go into Kerbro's mission. Primarily his illness and the fact that he only would have a couple more years as like I suppose a prime physical condition where he's able to go on these missions and be as skilled as he is and so he wanted to take them even if it meant having to sort of accept that ultimatum that Adam gave him which was that you know, he's been frustrated with Shiro making so many of these decisions given that he has this kind of illness. And he's put, he basically decided that this was the time, like, I can't go through this again. If you go, I won't be here when you get back. And I get it. I too wanted to see a little bit more of Adam. I think I saw immediately what they were doing given that there was only that one scene between the two of them. In that, like, okay, I think they may have them, like, have a scene together when Shiro gets back to Earth, but I think that's about it. Like I, I really, after watching that episode, didn't expect them to do much more. Um, but I get why people maybe did. But at the same time, it was a breakup. Shiro, we know through just like inferring, 
made the decision to go in the Kerberos mission, more or less accepted the fact that he and Adam would be broken up because of it. Uh, obviously he was captured and so on, everything that happened. But still, the, the whole point is that he sort of, Shiro put Adam through that again. And Adam had made the decision to kind of cut off ties with Shiro at that point. And that's fine. And I think that's actually decent depth for a relationship like this. And I, and I, I get, like, people were complaining that, like, one, obviously, I think the main complaint is that they killed off Adam. I think a secondary complaint is this kind of almost weird one, given the way it happened, that, like, they weren't as clear as they should have been with revealing that Shiro is gay in the show. And I'm just kind of like, given the way the scene went, like, what did you want them to do? They've clearly been in a relationship for a long time. We know from what they said that they're basically engaged at that point. When were they just suddenly randomly in the middle of a conversation going to, like, to each other, mention the fact that one or the other of them is in fact gay and, and have that be this very audience thing. That's a very forced scene if you have to put in the word gay in there somewhere, given that you're... The, the Shiro Adam thing is very confined to just the two of them. He men, uh, Shiro mentions Adam to Keith, but Keith gives absolutely no reaction. So it's, it's, it's a very personal thing between Shiro and Adam. Um, and then similarly, like, okay, maybe that you wanted them to specifically reference, like, talk about their relationship and it'd be very clear that it's not just friendship. But I think they did that in that, like, if they were just friends or roommates or whatever the uh, other option was for this, the wording from Adam of, like, if you go, I won't be here when you get back. Like, I don't think that is something two friends would say to each other. That is definitely romantic kind of thing. Plus, you get to see a slightly different side of Shiro talking to Adam because obviously the idea is that they both know each other so well. The the kind of slightly different side than you'd see against with other people kind of come out. Because um, Shiro's always the leader when he's around the rest of the team. Um, so them getting to see this side where he's with someone who is his kind of equal because they know each other so well. Has that other side of him come out where he just is very open about his feelings with Adam about all of this. Where he starts ranting, you know, about the decision made by the Admiral and so on. Um, and... Adam obviously showing a lot of concern for him, and I think more so than that. I think they were very clear as they could be, while also being like... Like, even if they could, I don't think the writers would want to be, like, overly forceful with saying, like... Like, directly have characters in dialogue say that they're a gay couple or anything like that. Um, or, like, trying to force specific words into the conversation words that make it overly clear instead they were just very natural and chilled about it because in the in reading some of the interviews that's what they wanted they wanted this to just be another aspect of shiro's character they didn't want it to become suddenly a defining trait for him or anything like that so them doing what they did is just like here's shiro's situation at this point in time he's trying to help out keith he wants to go on this mission He's in this relationship, but Adam is kind of, you know, pointing out that he doesn't want Shiro to go on it. You know, it, it was important to actually mention that, that he's in a relationship. But that is not the be-all and end-all, given that ultimately we know Shiro goes in the Kerberos mission. So the nature of that was there to obviously add, you know, that Shiro in a way had to sacrifice something in a way to go on this mission. But because of that, that relationship was broken up. So... While I get the sort of expectation that you maybe would expect him to meet Adam, and I think there was, they were sort of building up that, I think, in that obviously you see that when Shiro gets back and they're in the garrison, it, he clearly is told and finds out about it, and you can see that it's, he's upset. Plus, at the end, you, you get the, the, the gravesite where Adam is obviously mentioned there as well. I think they, they did it as well as they probably could without... Um, with, while I suppose with the intent that obviously they didn't want it to be a present day ongoing relationship going forward. Um, the whole, they killed off Adam and so they basically killed off like one of the only kind of gay relationships. Like I think that's a more a fairer point, but I still think it's it's giving the writers like 
no credit for everything that they just went with that that trope that people keep bringing up where you kill off gay characters i don't think that was really the intent here at all to just like get rid of the gay character on the show in that the way it worked out is obviously with the plot you wanted them to return to earth and find it basically 100% captured by the Galra. So you have that reaction from everyone. They've all lost something because they have to get Earth back. And with most of the Paladins, it would I think it would be too dark to for like a lot of the younger Paladins to kill off family members or something like that. Even though they teased it with I suppose Veronica with Lance. Um so Shiro ended up kind of of the main like Earth characters. Being that character where, like, okay, like, we want to have some of them come back and experience a loss. And because of the setup that they've done with Adam, where, like, because of how their relationship started and stuff like that, Adam, one of Adam's line of dialogue is that, like, we've been together every training session and stuff like that. Adam is also a pilot, but he is not a pilot on the, like, experimental um, Altaian tech fighters. So he would be part of just the standard fighter crew, and that's what the Admiral sends out to fight the Galra initially and ends up sacrificing them. And it's it's one of those ones where like probably I think what they should have done is like connected this stuff together a little better. In that like Shiro calling out the Admiral for basically getting Adam killed. Um and it being this kind of Thing that she has to deal with it would add more to her character it add more to Shiro and the impact I suppose of him actually becoming the leader and I suppose potentially wanting to make a decision that wouldn't have something like that happen again um, and it's unfortunate that that's the way it was set up but I think it was the way it is done the relationship was was part of the past they'd broken up already and I don't really the nature of how that breakup happened, I don't feel it was one where they were going to reunite and get back together. I think the fact that Shiro made that decision after Adam said that, I think kind of put a gulf between them where they could, probably wouldn't be able to get back together. At least that's my interpretation of it right now, given that we didn't get to know all that much. But I still think it was a good use of it, and I, I, I honestly would praise the show for not feeling the need to almost brag about the fact that they've done this or anything like that um obviously i think the creator sort of went down that road in some of the interviews but the way the show actually executed uh, I, I i think it was pretty well done because they were just relaxed about it they just made it a natural part of shiro's character without making it a huge part of his character because again romance hasn't been a focus of the show full stop why would it suddenly become the the core of Shiro's character? Given that some of the bigger relationships, like Lance and Laura, they're not even going too far with that. There's like Veronica teasing Lance about it once or twice. There's a blush at one point, and Allura and Lance have a scene. That's that's like it for probably the most heavy setup for a relationship in this um, uh, season so far. Um, so... There's that. Uh, the other one was obviously uh, Ezor and Zethrid. I believe in my first um, video covering episodes yesterday, I was kind of like, are they, are those two meant to be a couple now? And I think most people interpreted it that way as well. And then I, I think I was sort of like a bit nonchalant about like the nature of how Ezor and Zethrid were sort of killed in that I'm interpreting it as that like, they probably will have survived that in some way. I'd be I'd be fairly shocked if they just kept it that they both died there. And part of that is just like how I suppose casual Oxia was about basically killing them. I get they set them up as like warlords, they're more power hungry, they're similar to Lotor than maybe like the other good characters, but still I think we could see them again and I think that's more of a waste of just the characters rather than I think the point that most people are trying to make which is that like oh they wasted the LGBT relationship um, and that's that's just I suppose one of those things with, with a lot of fans out there where it seemed like it seems like a lot of people watch this show primarily for the aim of getting to LGBT relationships and that's really it which is fine but it's also a case of 
like with these people, you, you they never talk about the plot. They never talk about character arcs or anything like that. All they care about is just specific relationships happening, and that's never the the healthiest way, I think, to to watch a show. Um, especially if with a lot of these things, it's just oh, it didn't happen again this season. This character's going in another direction, and that's like the whole Keith Oxia thing, where like. I feel like I've been one of the earliest people who's kind of been like, I think they're going into this direction. That once Oxia was revealed to be the one who Keith saved from the Weblum, I felt that like, okay, that they're making a connection between these two. And then the seasons going on, they've always sort of like, returned the favor to each other, kind of saving each other from things a couple of times. And, you know, there's been a couple of pretty salty people about, I suppose, Keith-centric relationships about the fact that this may be the direction that he's heading in. Um, so that's obviously another just f f funny part of the fandom, just shipping wars basically being a thing again. Um, but other than that, like I actually like the way relationships were done. Like uh, Obviously, I don't think the Keith, the, the Shiro and Adam stuff was perfect, but for what it was, I actually thought it was, it was pretty well done and a pretty good use of representation, in my opinion, given the overall arc direction of Shiro's character um, and uh, I suppose yeah moving on to I suppose more the, the second half of the series plot once they got back to earth I think stuff picked up because we are readily able to connect with the earth centric characters that two-parter really got across the kind of the gulf in technology with how much work Sam had to do to just get the garrison to do anything and then board borderline like being forced to out, out all of the secrets publicly to people against orders to make anything bigger happen and obviously the the admiral is a very frustrating character sanda i think it is because of course she hinders all of this and then if you go all the way back to like the first episode which was the one of the connections i made there Sanda is also the one who initially wants to not have Shiro go on, on that mission. So she's very much presented as the person who's making the decisions that obviously are bad for our main characters. And there's you can sort of, in a way, see her intent, but they go so far, especially with the betrayal to, to Semdak, uh, it's very hard to try and redeem her. And I think... They had to, I think at that point, they had to kill her. I think she couldn't survive what happened. I think her sacrificing herself to allow the paladins to connect kind of remotely with their lines, pilot them in that way, and then, in a way, pass the protecting of Earth onto them made complete sense. It, it, it obviously opened up the leadership position for Shiro to take um, and took away... I suppose this sort of neg negative influence on the paladins and the defense of Earth. Um, so, in the end, I think they used her character fairly well in that while obviously her decisions made it so that it was very difficult to get behind her. At the very least, them being, them using her as probably the most, in a way, violent kind of because of how they showed it there. They showed her getting hit in the shoulder, getting hit in the stomach, she's down. And they showed her dying. They they showed her dying her final seconds on screen, and because of that, like it's it was sort of worth it in a way, just showing the the last stand of this admiral coming around right at the end. But does it make up for all of her actions? Probably not. Like imagine how things would have went if the plan wasn't known earlier on. So, you know, I actually think they they did an okay job with that. A character they made you hate. And you absolutely did, but they still managed to at least make you care somewhat right at the end. So, there was that. Um, I think with the Semdak fight with Shiro, I think the only problem I have is the Keith coming in right at the end to finish the, finish the job. That was Shiro's fight, I think, completely. And I thought it was... It was a bit like faultless, I suppose, potentially as a writing decision to just have Keith come in and just... One second, basically, Zarkon and uh, Semdak is gone. Um, like, I get it. Like, Shiro has had bigger victories as the leader of Team Voltron earlier on the season. But this was his personal fight, I feel. And you sort of 
needed, I think, to give him the victory in this fight. Um, and I don't know how much it really does for Keith that he, he got this victory, but, you know, I don't have too big of an issue with it, but I would have preferred it just that it was a one-on-one -on -one fight with uh, Shiro and Samdak. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the whole... As I brought up in one of my other videos, um, the nature of the final fight, and I suppose the format of how these writers choose to do the final battles, it is become, beginning to come a little... To become a little stale for me. I, I think that's the only real issue I had with the action surrounding the finale. As I said, there's always like a big mech battle. There's always the need to like infiltrate something, put down a shield or something like that. And then when the battle comes to an end, there's always some sort of a big explosion thing that's about to happen that is this last ditch thing that the paladins need to solve. And we got sort of all that once again. Again, the whole laser thing as well. There's always some sort of a like, this thing is about to fire, we need to stop it. And you had that with the plates and the Zyforge cannons. Um, you had the explosion at the end once the, the big Robies kind of uh, Voltron-like uh, mech came in. You had the actual fight against the, the, the Voltron mech. Um, and no, none of the action felt, like, utterly mind-blowing to me. I, I think what it was is, is the takeaway here. Um... And I hope they manage to get that back and they make the action feel a little bit more unique as we go into the next season. Now, that's not to say, like, animation-wise, like, all the action was bad or anything like that. There were definitely some nice sequences, but just the, um, the kind of story beats of how the action scene played out were not the best. As, as I explained in, in one of my videos there, just the, the way the fight played out with the, the kind of Altaian piloted mech of... It just destroying Voltron for like 10 minutes. Atlas transforms. It gets destroyed, basically. Uh, and then Voltron comes in, finishing blow right at the end. Really suddenly, very quickly. A little rushed right at the end. I think with stuff like Semdak being suddenly killed by Keith like that. Um, the, the suddenness of discovering the weak spot of the, the mech. Um, and wrapping things up fairly quick. It was somewhat saved by the fact that there is another season and we'll get, I assume, our big epilogue type stuff in season 8. But, um, you know, uh, just a lot of little things that, you know, hold it back from being perfect. And, you know, just little things like, okay, the, the, the coalition comes in immediately after all of this. All of a sudden, the second things are over, within a day or two, they can contact everyone they need to and be there. That was just a bit like okay, okay, I get it, you want to have the happy ending with the coalition forming up again, but you couldn't contact them before now, even when Voltron came back and stuff like that, there's no way to make this happen, fine. Um, so, yeah, th there were disappointments this season, but I think there were also a lot of really strong points. I think character-wise, it continues to be the big strength of the show, more so than the like giant mech fighting, which you'd expect from a Voltron show. Hunk had had some really nice moments over the course of the season. How he was the one who really got them out of the mess when they were trapped in space on their own. Um, the Keith and Hunk, I thought, actually had some nice interactions over this season. Getting across, I suppose, the more serious side of Hunk as a character and what he brings to the team. Of the fact that because he can get over his weaknesses, it makes him one of the stronger paladins because he almost is the one you least expect to be like the one of the more kind of uh, standout paladins. Um, Keith and Lance had some nice moments because while I don't think there was anything overly standout, just moments like Lance obeying Keith's orders with no question for the most part, calling him team leader. Um, when, she, when Keith went off to save Oxia, he left Lance in charge. Just the little aspect of them setting up that leader and right-hand man relationship between the two of them that they've done such a good job at developing over the course of the season. Now, obviously, I'm not interpreting this, any of that as being romantic. I, I, I don't see Clans really at all. Sorry if you do ship it, but uh, I've always just interpreted it as this sort of fracturous friendship which as the two characters are maturing, they're realizing that they are actually, you know, close friends. Uh, you know, if they go for the romance, I suppose, fine. But 
it doesn't feel like it's really being set up just yet. Um, Allura Lands, of course, is more romantic setup. Uh, they didn't do a lot with Pidge this season, but I don't think they necessarily needed to. Instead, I suppose her family got the spotlight. Sam Holt and, uh, and also Colleen Co Colt um, got the spotlight. Holt, actually, sorry. Um, and again, I, I thought that was really good. The way they, like, we, we knew Sam a little bit because once we got him back, we kind of sent him on his way after, fairly soon after we got him back, but getting across how high up in the military he is and him sticking to his guns, convincing everyone and going against the leadership of the Galaxy Garrison to get done what he needed to, I thought was excellent. And I think they've done a great job at um, overall characterizing the whole Holt family. I think that's been a huge success. Um, I think we would have liked to have spent maybe a little bit more time with like Lance's family or Hunk's family, but we might be able to see a little bit more of them in the early parts of Season 8, maybe the very end of Season 8, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how they go. Um, stuff like Shay coming in was nice, but there were also points like, as I said with Oxia, just her appearing, being missing, and then appearing right at the end. Ramel seemed to kind of come and go as well as a character in terms of just, okay, she's with the group here, then they get back to Earth, then she's not really used all that much, but then she's suddenly back right at the end. Little, little things like that, just keeping track of where characters are, using where all your characters are effectively was not the, the best done thing. So I think this is a good season. It has its problems, but I still really did enjoy it. And I think it's set up enough that I think the last season is going to be very good. I think it is going to be really, really good. And um, you'll probably see a speculation video for season eight from me maybe next week if I have the time um, and then the podcast review for season 7 will be next week also so look out for that but uh, yeah that's been the video thanks for watching and bye